Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tax Talk, broadcast by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. My name is Jordan Bateman, and I'm the British Columbia Director of the CTF. And I'm joined, as always, by our Alberta Director, Paige McPherson. Paige, how are you? Doing well, thanks. I feel like we've been on a little bit of a hiatus. We've been on the road with the Debt Clock Tour, and now we're back for Tax Talk. So it's good. Feeling good. How about you? You've seen all of uh, Alberta now. You've seen every little uh, highway stand, every byway, every flyway. You've been everywhere, man. It's true. From the north to the south. The only place that I haven't gone yet that I still want to go is Lloydminster. So that's, that's <laughs> the last on my Alberta bucket list. <laughs> what, are you, what are you getting paid by Lloydminster Tourism here to plug them? What's going on? I don't know, I don't know man. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining us here live on Blab for Tax Talk. Paige and I are joined today by a true ally in the battle against municipal tax hikes. Amber Ruddy is the Alberta Director of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and a uh, key member, a founder with Paige of the C Charter Think Taxes Coalition. We'll be talking about municipal taxes today and how certain mayors keep wanting more of your money. I'm looking at you, Nahid Nenshi. <laughs> Lots of ways for people to connect with us. If you've joined us here live, make sure to subscribe to our feed to keep track of our shows. You can comment in the sidebar. You can tweet us at Jordan Bateman, at Paige McPee, at A Ruddy. Uh, we're uh, there. Uh, and willing to listen. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation is a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization dedicated to three things lower taxes, less waste, and more government accountability. That's what drives all the communications, research, advocacy work, and road trips with the debt clock that we do. <laughs> Be sure to visit the website at taxpayer.com and see what we've all been up to. Uh, if you're listening to this later as a podcast or recording, you can email me at bc.director at taxpayer.com or give us hack at facebook.com slash taxpayer.com. All right. Hey, uh, Paige, we'll start with you. What's new? Well, the thing that's been sort of dominating the political chatter in Alberta lately is this idea that Jason Kenney is potentially going to throw his hat in the ring uh, to to unite the right. So it's sort of a weird situation. We've got these the two parties here on the right, uh, the PCs who were in power in Alberta for 44 years. They were the ones ousted by the NDP in his last election. And then Wild Rose. Uh, and, uh, and they're... they're you know, I don't know, they've got a weird relationship, like sometimes they flirt with the idea of uniting, but it's, I think essentially they're, they're kind of, it's, it's at a standstill. Um, and a lot of people have said for some time that what it would take is sort of a, a leader to come in and kind of lead the uniting of the right. And so I guess Jason Kenney has been thinking, perhaps, and is thinking of throwing his hat in the ring. It's, a, it's speculation at this point, nothing is officially announced, but it could be very interesting. And now the questions are coming up, you know, would he actually be effective in uniting the right? Would he actually be effective in taking down Rachel Notley if that's their goal? So it's been kind of interesting. Oh, the police are coming. They're, they're upset with us. <laughs> yeah, and just as background. You know, like the idea of Kenny. <laughs> yeah, just as background, Jason Kenny, uh, one of the uh, founding fathers of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, left us uh, in the late 90s. Some monumental fights with uh, uh, Ralph Klein and, and the uh, Liberal government at the time. Yeah. Um, has been a longtime Harper cabinet minister, uh, citizenship and immigration for most of that time, very powerful, uh, considered very powerful among the membership in the Conservative Party of Canada. Um, and, you know, all around, I think, very decent guy. Um, I, I gotta be honest, I don't live in Alberta, so I, I only see it from afar, but I think the most laughable things I see out of Alberta, like Gary Mason had a piece on this today in the Globe and Mail, um, somehow comparing Jason Kenney to Jim Prentice, simply because they were both federal politicians. Now, Jim, Jim Prentice is no Jason Kenney. Am I fair in that? I think so, yeah. So um, <laughs> it's funny, there, those, those sort of comparisons are being made, not just by, uh, by Gary Mason, but people are saying like, you have to be careful if you, if you want to be Premier of Alberta, you can't just sort of fly in from Ottawa and have your team of Ottawa people around you and just assume that everybody's gonna love you just you know because you're kind of this sort of big shot from Ottawa. So there's, there's that thing going on, but you know, Jason Kenney's style is so different than Jim Prentice's style. Jim Prentice at the time was seen as uh, has arrogant, I think, by by some Albertans, and that was an issue. Uh, and you know, compared to Rachel Notley and the sort of gritty, grassrootsy NDP, um, that was a really stark 
difference, right? A stark contrast. Uh, Jason Kenney's entering this in a different way, a different set of political circumstances. And I think that his style is more that sort of grassrootsy style. So I don't think you're going to see the same kind of effect uh, as Jim Prentice is having. The other thing is that Jason Kenney is very driven um, by, I think, by his beliefs. So he's sort of a big kind of issues guy. Jim Prentice wasn't really like that. Um, he was a little more establishment theming. So, so yeah, I agree. I don't think that that's a... I mean, I understand the comparison that they're making, but I don't think it will play out that way. Amber, what do you think? Well, I think it's interesting that you have so many federal MPs coming down. If you look at Ontario, they're now being led by Patrick Brown. Mm -hmm. If you look at what's happening in Manitoba, there's a lot of uh, people that I think are very interested in what's going on in the provincial level. And, you know, maybe those are the set of issues that speak better to um, their kind of um, belief systems. But yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out because, yeah, you know, you're right about the whole dynamic. It's a bit of a weird situation where you have uh, the players from the various uh, parties figuring out, uh, you know, what's next for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a phenomenon we don't really see in British Columbia because, of course, the BC Liberals here are a hybrid of the Conservatives and Liberals. So you don't see a lot of MPs stepping into that simply because, mm. um, you know, they have enemies on one side of the aisle or the other, or one side of the, the tent or the other. Um, the NDP here feed people up to the federal, Jenny Kwan most notably, mm -hmm. uh, former MLA who uh, resigned her seat and, and has been sworn as an MP, conveniently right after she maxed out her pension here. Uh, <laughs> now she gets to go to Ottawa and build a second one, but that's mm -hmm. a, an issue for another day. Um, I did. I did see Kenny uh, a few weeks ago in Calgary at a at a speaking thing I was doing, and um, like it was amazing to watch, uh, you know, business person after business person go to him and ask him to come back to Alberta. There was no talk of Conservative Party leadership there. It was all, you know, come home, come save us. <laughs> it, it must be. It, it must tug on a politician's ego to hear that kind of feedback. It must. And I mean, you know, frankly, the right is, they're scrambling in Alberta right now. It's just, that's the case. The, the PCs obviously were decimated in the election. I think the Wild Rose is having a lot of, um, I don't know, they, they seem to be getting in the headlines for the wrong reasons, sort of consistently one time after the other. And uh, and I think there's sort of a, a tug of war a little bit maybe going on between their base and, uh, and then maybe the elected people or the people in Edmonton. That's what it seems like to me as an outsider. But either way, you know, I think that the argument has been made by many that um, the opposition is not as effective as it could be, <laughs> perhaps. So so I think that there is an appetite for something. What, what I think is going to be interesting, if like, okay, so pre assuming that Jason Kenney does put his hat in the ring and he does run and he does run for the PCs, um, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens within that party because they're sort of a weird coalition too, sort of like the BC Liberals. Uh, they've just been sort of the party in power forever. So it's this weird um, party where in some uh, cases you can get sort of these grassroots fiscal conservatives to help you win leadership. And in some cases you can levy the teachers unions and the nurses unions to help you get into the leadership. And so it's this weird... Um, coalition, I guess, of people. And, and so what I think if Kenny were to run for that party, you would probably see a little bit of an exodus of the more left leaning people in that party. And I don't, I, the question would be, where would they go? That's, that's another interesting element here. You know, would they go to the Alberta Liberal Party? Would they join the NDP? I don't know. Well, you've already Every seen that too, with Sandra Jansen mm -hmm. uh, coming out and saying that either she's going to run to lead the party or that she's totally out of the picture. So yeah, that dynamic is definitely going to have to play itself out because some people put a little bit more emphasis on the progressive than on the conservative, and uh, <laughs> that's that's part of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, well, never dull. Let's see with you. Never dull. Well, uh, I think we should talk about Brexit. Obviously, the uh, the British voted fifty two forty eight last night to leave the European Union. If you uh, follow any of the elites on Twitter or Facebook or uh, watch the BBC feed, my God, the world is ending. I am reliably informed, that was by Boris Johnson, so I'm not sure how reliably, that the sun did rise on the British Empire this morning. <laughs> um, life will go on. Uh, talking to some people who watch this stuff, uh, money markets, they think that most of these losses, that financial losses have happened today will rebound in the weeks to come. It was more the surprise than anything else. But um, I don't know, I'm a bit of a, I have a bit of an anti-establishment bent uh, to me. So uh, seeing the uh, political chattering classes, the elites um, 
spanked uh, publicly in a referendum uh, is uh, is something that I always quite enjoy. I don't understand sometimes why um, these elites, as you call them, don't understand that crying about how democracy is a failure because they didn't get the result that they want and saying that, oh my God, I can't believe that there's so many bigoted racists in, uh, in the UK, this is unbelievable, when they don't get the result that they want. It's kind of exactly the reason that those people don't want to be controlled by that kind of an elite establishment, right? <laughs> so I don't know why they don't make that connection, but it's funny, like you even have people in Alberta and we've been pushing for referenda on certain things. Wilder's been pushing for referenda. You have sort of Alberta Twitter people saying, this is exactly why referendum or referenda is a bad idea. Like why? Because democracy, this is why democracy is a bad idea because sometimes you don't get the result that you want. It's uh these these things always uh, breed that kind of discussion. But I was talking about the referenda itself uh, last night, and one of the things that came up was, do you think 50% is a fair threshold, or do you think it should be more? Because in electoral reform um, referenda here in, in Canada, we've often had at least 60%. Do you think I think 50% make, just makes sense. I think anything else is arbitrary, but... Uh, I think when you're change, maybe when you're changing the rules of how you elect people, like you're actually changing the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. I, I can see the argument for 60, although I'm a simple majority guy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if it had been a simple majority in BC, we'd have a single transferable vote because yeah. that was passed by 57% of people in early 2000s, but uh, it didn't hit the 60 threshold. Um, that said, in something like this, which isn't changing the rules of how you elect people or the democratic system, 50% plus one, I think is, it's a majority and certainly all the way through the, uh, the remain side, you know, continually, which has all the power and all the levers uh, to actually put this into place mm -hmm. and could stop it. They could overthrow the will of people and stop it, although they'd be insane to do it. Um, they said that 50% plus one. So as long as you know going in, I think that's a fair threshold. Mm -hmm. Amber, is your uh, Facebook and Twitter feeds just blowing up with people freaking out about how <laughs> how could people vote against their own self-interest? It does seem that way. And I think from the small business perspective, you've got these big boulders shifting around, but uh, the small businesses are kind of the pebbles that uh, fill in the crack. So it's going to be interesting to see as all the chips fall, you know, um, how this will impact different uh, free trade agreements and different, um, you know, kind of deals going on because it is hard to deal with a lot of regulation, you know, when you have the EU setting all sorts of uh, regulatory requirements from a small business perspective, uh, mm -hmm. that can be a big burden. But uh, I guess we'll we'll wait and see what happens and how the, the chips uh, continue to fall. I think it was a big part of the regulation. Um, but now that they have, now they have to pen like a, a whole bunch of new free trade agreements, right? The UK does sort of. But they get to negotiate UK specific ones. I mean, look, yeah, we're Canadians. Uh, we're not part of the uh, European Union. We're part of NAFTA, but that doesn't control how we negotiate other agreements. We're part of perhaps the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We have a deal pending with the EU, but that doesn't prevent us from going out and negotiating country to country deals. Um, you know, the UK will do the same. The question is, you know, will the Euro countries try to punish them by not negotiating one with the Euro? Well, that, that actually hurts the Euro countries too. So cut mm -hmm. off your nose to spite your face, have at it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it's the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. It's not like we're all going to turn our backs on Britain now and say, oh, no one can do a deal with Britain because they're out of the European Union. That's exactly. It'll take some time, but they'll be able to uh, negotiate things that are important. Now, the key is David Cameron's resigning. Whoever becomes the next prime minister, you've got to have a savvy deal maker in place. You can't just replicate these free trade agreements that the public are clearly un unhappy with. Uh, trade agreement, not free, but trade agreements. Uh, something needs to change there. Um, so, uh, you got to start finding some uh, some deal makers and people who really uh, know how to negotiate with other countries to to lead uh, to lead the UK through this. I think this is a part of an anti-establishment wave that's happening in politics in the Western world right now. Like, do you see any similarities between this and the whole Trump thing? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see uh, a movement in France, you see a movement in Holland, you see. Um, that things happening all over the world, you know, even in our little piece of, you know, the world in BC, um, a lot of the TransLink vote was about anti-establishment, not liking the way we we're being governed, not liking the way money was being spent, being wasted, regulation, all that thing, unhappiness. It's a great chance to send a message. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, the middle class especially is, you know, the noose is around our necks. A study came out showing that um, you would have to spend 87% of income to afford a house in Vancouver. 
87%, which is like on par with Queens, New York. And, you know, Brooklyn is the worst in the world at 102%. Like we're getting pretty close here to, uh, to craziness. So middle-class families are feeling tighter and tighter. These tax breaks, uh, you know, they, they seem to get focused on, um, well, the tax breaks always seem to wash out because government still manages to extract revenue from us. And, you know, it's the middle class is feeling the pinch. So they're starting to rise up and talk about it. The more interesting thing from Brexit was that the young wanted to stay in the EU and the old wanted to leave. Um, that to me is an interesting dynamic that I'm not quite sure how that will manifest in the future. Um, it may just be that younger British people feel a little bit more mobile and connected to Europe than the older ones who some of them still remember bailing out Europe in World War II, right? Like they have a different viewpoint on uh, on your relationship with Europe. Right. Yeah, that is an interesting part. All right, Amber. So what's new with you? What's new in your world, which is, you know, similar to my world, both in Calgary? <laughs> well, it seems like the list of taxes that keep popping up for discussion is long. And it makes me think of the Conference Board of Canada just yesterday was floating the idea that we need a provincial sales tax once again. Um, and if you look at the whole context, I mean, we've got a carbon tax coming in, um, property taxes are going up, we have minimum wage hikes, the list is getting really long. And at some point, we have to draw the line in the sand and say, like, look, this is enough. Um, and I, I think the whole discussion around a carbon tax being a sales tax um, is interesting, because might as well just car call it a carbon tax, because they're talking about a sales tax, too. So, yeah. um, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's that's coming up and I, I think even um, in Calgary the whole discussion of let's have an honest discussion about taxes you know it's about time and and I hope we can continue to do that over the next uh, few days as they go to vote on Monday for a freeze in 2017. Mm -hmm. Yeah Calgary City Councillors uh, for anybody not in Calgary have put out the call basically to to residents and said, okay, if you don't want your taxes to go up, then what do you want us to cut in services? And we hear a lot of rhetoric from the counselors about how, well, you know, what's it going to be? <laughs> You're going to have to see a dramatic drop in services. So what's it going to be? And I mean, which library will yeah. you close? Yeah. Paid? Which neighborhood do you not want to be policed? Like <laughs> so it's, uh, it's the same rhetoric that we hear from the provincial government and federal government, anytime that, you know, the idea of cuts are raised, it's the same kind of stuff that we hear. Um, and uh, yeah, that conference board, let's talk about that, because that's made headlines now, because they're saying that, oh, we recommend a provincial sales tax. They also recommended cuts in spending, particularly in healthcare, where we are very bloated in Alberta in terms of our, our spending on that uh, relative to the other provinces, especially given the fact that we don't have the same kind of problems with an aging population as other provinces do. And uh, that never makes the headlines, right? <laughs> it's the sexy sales tax idea that always makes the headlines. Well, it's also the fact that let's look at other provinces. Everybody else has a PST, a HST, but, you know, Ontario also has a huge debt. They're also not controlling spending. So, you know, we don't have to set the bar uh, just at whatever everybody else is doing. That's not how to set good uh, fiscal policy. No, I mean, from the perspective of, like, I've lived in the Maritimes. I don't want to have an economy like they have in the Maritimes. I'd much rather have an economy like we've had in, in Alberta, where it's, you know, relatively strong. You're not relying on transfer payments. Just because one province is doing something does not mean <laughs> that it makes sense for you to do that as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. You see, I, when you, the problem with politicians is <clears throat> when you're a hammer, everything you look at looks like a nail. And the solution is always more taxes, right? Vacant housing in uh, in Vancouver, 7% of condos or something don't have people living in them because for various reasons. So what does Gregor Robertson say? Oh, we should tax vacant condos more. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a sales site, like it, it, it's ridiculous, but that's the solution to every single problem they have is more taxes. Um, as if we're not paying enough, as if 43% of our income going to uh, various levels of government Ha, you know, is not enough to file, to fuel the system. Well, in Calgary too, you know, it's not just, it's not uh, hating taxes for the sake of hating taxes. There's a human impact, right? And that's what we want to talk to you, Amber, about is, you know, the stuff that you've heard from businesses, because 
it seems like you can't open a newspaper or look on your Twitter news feed uh, without seeing the headlines of another Calgary small business closing. Like it's re it's happening very rapidly across the city. And so there is a human impact to continuing to tax and tax and tax excessively. Um, so Amber, what, I mean, so you're with Canadian Federation of Independent Business. You talk to small businesses all the time. What have you heard from people? Well, here in uh, the city of Calgary, we have about uh, 2,500 members of CFIB, and there is a silent majority that simply can't spend their days going to City Hall and complaining and going every year back to the uh, Appeals Commission to get that tax bill down, even if it, it happened last year. And, you know, the municipal level is a level of government that seems to have little scrutiny. You know, it's a level of government that can get away with a lot, and that's why CFIB has um, started doing a series of municipal reports, one of them being a municipal tax report. And the idea that um, business and residents, you know, sometimes the burden gets shifted onto business owners because the idea is they don't vote. Um, it's, you know, less painful for a politician to put that burden on a business owner rather than a resident. So, you know, this, um, we started doing a tax report that looked at how much more businesses pay in taxes than residents. And in Calgary, they pay 3.75 times more than a resident. So just to give you an example, on $100,000 of assessed property, a resident would pay, for example, $375, while a business would pay $1,069. And um, in Calgary is one of the few jurisdictions that still has this very archaic, old school, draconian tax, a business tax. And that's levied in addition to the property taxes. So when we do our calculations, we put that in there because there's only three municipalities left in the whole province of you know 350 municipalities, and that needs to go. And I think the discussion around um, consolidating it is not what we were advocating for. We were advocating for a pure elimination, but uh, that message has not uh, set in yet with the mayor and council. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, you reminded me of something when you were talking about how, you know, they, they spend time going to the appeals board or they have to go and spend time sort of wading through red tape. There is a case in Calgary of, um, you know, a, a small bistro that closed down. It was in downtown Calgary for 20 years, a Scoba Bistro. And he's been very vocal about the impact that his property tax bill had on his business. Last year, he contacted me because he had a 97% property tax increase. And he spent $14,000 and obviously a ton of time and effort fighting it. He won. He ended up paying something like $35,000 instead of $67,000 or something like that. And uh, and then he got the a property tax bill again. Um, so it was uh, like again this year and it was again hiked substantially. And so now he's shut down on June 1st. 25 employees that now are out of work. And uh, and it's funny because you can imagine that period of relief for business owners when they, you know, okay, they spend that time and they appeal it and they go through the red tape and okay, success, I've won. I can now go back to focusing on actually, you know, on, on my business trying to probably drive sales given our economy now. And, uh, and then again, to be hit with that again and think you have to appeal again. Like it's just, it's so much for these business owners when really they should just be focusing on their business. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the things that business owners are doing to stay alive, they're cutting back on the number of hours they're able to provide. They are downsizing. Um, a lot of cases, I had uh, some members uh, emailing, calling in this past week, especially as all this hit um, the, the headlines, because I think it resonates. It hits a raw nerve with business owners that, yeah, you know, this is affecting me too, but I don't have the time to keep going down to City Hall year after year to fight for it. And some are just unfortunately throwing uh, the towel in. They're, they're just done. They're sick of it. And um, I think we have a real opportunity here on Monday to vote for a freeze in the 2017 property taxes. We've seen a lot of proposals before. Last year, we had talk about $52 million. How can we you know, use this money? And I frankly thought it should be returned to taxpayers. But they had a Dragon's Den forum, you know, soliciting ideas on how they could spend this newfound money. Then again, another proposal came forward um, earlier this year, and it was to rebate some money back to small businesses that were, you know, caught in this difficult time because they were figuring, oh, well, maybe we don't have to put all this chunk of money in the reserve fund. We have a sizable rainy day fund. Let's uh, put this money to work. That got voted down. So time after time, we're seeing proposals just being left by the wayside. And 
Um, I think it, it comes back to the other issue. So that's the tax side, but you know, where is the money going? So CFIB also does a municipal operating spending report. So this just looks at the city operations, not all the capital infrastructure projects, because I guess the case can be made in some cases, you need that. But this looks at the pure operations. And over the past 10 years, the city of Calgary has been spending three times what is sustainable. Our members think a sustainable benchmark is population and inflation growth. At some point, you know, you do need to add a little bit as people are coming to the city, you know, require more services. But the level and the pace that the municipal spending is growing is simply ridiculous. And it's time to get that back in check. We have lots of ideas on how they can rein that in. Uh, another report that we do is the municipal spending watch report um, in terms of wages, salaries and benefits. And if you are a city of Calgary employee, for example, you're an accountant or you know a middle manager, you're making a 7% premium on your salary alone and a 19% premium when you factor in your wages, salaries, and benefits. So, you know, something has to give here. We're going into new contract negotiations <laughs> uh, and there have been some ideas. Let's freeze, you know, Paige, you had a great suggestion to show the symbolic leadership to um, the mayor and council to take a salary rollback so that they could go into the contract negotiations in good faith given the unfortunate context that we're in and get a 0%, a freeze. We need some way to rein in all these escalating costs. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's funny because <clears throat> you know you have people like Nenji come out and say, okay, we, we can't do this without cutting services. And actually, if you were to, um, so given the, given the premium that people have, so, so uh, what was it, 18 or 19% premium uh, when you account for wages and benefits, if uh, if councillors were, you're right, I've called for a symbolic, symbolic rollback so they could go in and sort of with that tone of restraint. If you were to roll back <clears throat> the property to, or the uh, rather salaries across the board in the city of Calgary by 5%, which is not dramatic given what business owners have done. I mean, you, like I said, they're in the news all the time. You see business owners saying, I've taken a 50% cut. I'm not getting paid this year. Um, it's really not that much when you uh, when you account for that. Uh, but if you are to, uh, I'm just looking for the exact number here. So if you were to, to get a 5% rollback across the board, we calculated that you could save over $119 million in 2017, just as an example year, that would amount to a 2.57% property tax cut. So that's not what the city sort of is selling as a property tax cut, which is, oh, we planned on increasing it 4.7, but we're going to bring it down to 3.5. So that's a cut. Well, you're actually, it's still an increase. This is a real cut from zero, 2.57% just by rolling back salaries um, by 5% across the board. And I know that, you know, I say just, it's not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of effort, um, but but that's something that, you know, wouldn't impact services. And that's a 2.57% cut. So if they want to get to a freeze, making some progress on salaries and then looking at other line items in their budget that they could cut back on, I mean, it, you, you you see there that it's not actually that difficult to get to zero. You don't actually have to slash and burn police or libraries or anything like that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And what's even more concerning to me is that Mayor Nenshi keeps referencing property taxes as a lousy way to fund government. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what he wants to replace it with. And that's why we have that C Charter Think Tax Coalition with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and Common Sense Calgary because we're pushing back, you know, the transport um, committee has been studying 20 plus new types of taxes they would introduce if given the power. Everything from a municipal sales tax to a fuel tax, um, amusement fees, land transfer taxes, enough is enough. Like let's get the spending under control we can't sustain all sorts of a barrage of new taxes. Mm -hmm. Well, Jordan, you might have something to say about that given uh, the experience with the, obviously the no translink tax campaign, which was successful, but just what, you know, what can happen when the mayors have the ability to get their hands on these new taxes? Yeah, when, uh, when the Greater Vancouver Transit Authority decided they wanted a 0.5% sales tax to, to fund their regional operation, it's a municipal organization, they wanted this money. Uh, we had a plebiscite here in Vancouver, and we led the no side and, and won that 6238. But there was no one more devastated by the loss of this uh, potential sales tax than Nenshi, Don Iveson, Brian Bowman in Winnipeg, John Tory in Toronto. These were mayors who had been counting on Vancouver leading the charge, 
starting to get a municipal sales tax, and then they were planning to, you know, domino effect across the country, uh, get more. And their tweets, you know, the day of the uh, the great no side victory were ridiculous, you know, you know, sure. calling us uh, backward thinking and, and all sorts of uh, uh, just little digs at, uh, you know, the average guy who doesn't want to pay more in taxes, especially not to, to municipal governments. There's a great actual study that um, the BC government did a couple of years ago, and it compared municipal wages to... Um, federal uh, wages to provincial wages and to inflation. And they found that municipal wages were growing at like two or three times the rate of provincial government wages, uh, faster than federal government wages, uh, and several times the rate of inflation. The mayors at the time poo-pooed that report, attacked it, said it was a uh, complete malarkey, and we're going to produce our own report and show you the real facts. Um, I foiped that real report uh, from the group that's supposedly doing it, and lo and behold, they've had it for months and quietly have just kind of put it in the dustbin and, oh, it's, it, it's still a draft, so it's unlikely it'll ever come out, uh, which tells you that, you know, the numbers were probably right bang on. Um, and that reinforces, I, I got to say, the great work the CFIB has done on, especially the spending side. I mean, municipal politicians hate that report because um, it means phone calls from the media, it means phone calls from the public actually holding them to account, which is, uh, you know, the only way we're going to get any change here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they're talking sales tax. Yeah, oh God help, God save Alberta. <laughs> Run <laughs> like once that starts. The, the biggest problem I have is these taxes never stop at, at what they are, right? Like they come in at one percent. It'll be five percent within a matter of you know a decade. Um, you know, you bring in a vehicle levy of fifty dollars, it'll end up being a, you know a levy of one hundred and fifty dollars. They just cannot control themselves, and, and that's why you know the Taxpayers Federation we fight so hard against any new form of taxation, simply because we know they'll never stop at what they're doing. Um, yeah, exactly. it's another yeah. app. Yeah, tell me about Common Sense Calgary. I haven't heard of them before. Are they property so, tax group local or? Yeah, they're a local group. Um, they're run by Stephanie Cousy. Um, they were sort of loosely affiliated with the Manning Center for a little while, and now they've broken off and are independent. Um, it's, it's basically just a, kind of like a municipal watchdog group, but they also propose ideas um, for, for how spending can be cut or just, you know, finding efficiencies in City Hall. They propose ideas um, for, for tax relief and sort of give the numbers on it. So they, this week actually, uh, have put out a, a little campaign, zero for zero, basically talking about how if you don't increase wages at all, it's keeping it at zero, that you can get to a zero percent property tax uh, increase or decrease. So um, it's been good. It's funny, this week a lot of people are coming out with these ideas because councillors have finally said, <laughs> you're finally getting councillors saying, okay, fine, you want to see spending cuts? What do you want to see? And so groups like ours, like me and Amber and Common Sense Calgary, we're like, we've been waiting for this. We have a huge list. <laughs> but then, but then I read that and then she said that no one from the public has ever talking to him about tax increases? Is that well, so yeah, he was in the Calgary Sun the other day saying, no, you know, people don't really want tax cuts. Um, they're, you know, they, because they don't want service cuts. And uh, it's so funny because the city of Calgary did a survey uh, and it was in January and February, they did the survey, they interviewed 7,500 people. And the overwhelming result of that survey was tax cuts, cut any unnecessary spending and cut our taxes. So it's just so funny to say, no, you know what? I haven't heard that any Calgarians have, have wanted tax cuts. Like, why do you do this survey if you are not going to listen to the results? But in previous years, when Calgarians have said, no, you know what? We're happy with services. We're happy with this. Maybe we want a new library in this neighborhood or whatever it might be. Council and the mayor love to sort of tout that and say, see, look, they, they want more of this. But then the year when people are like, hey, we're really feeling the pinch here. We don't want to have tax increases. We don't have tax cuts. Then it's, it's like this report has conveniently disappeared. And, and the mayor has never heard that anybody wants tax cuts other than <laughs> 7,500 survey respondents. <laughs> yeah, well, what can you expect? Hey, Amber, run through uh, the, the charter side of this. So the, the big cities, they want their own charters and I assume new tax powers. Is that well, it's a conversation that's been going on for a number of years. And what we've seen is there have been memorandum of understanding signed by the big city mayors and the premier, I think three times over now. Uh, but basically what's happened is it's gone behind closed doors. So we don't really have very many details. And Paige, in fact, was able to ask a great question at the Municipal Government Act review. So the uh, Municipal Affairs Minister is on tour for the summer discussing proposals on how to reform the Municipal Government Act. 
the key thing that was missing was any mention of a city charter. And so Paige was able to um, pin the minister down and ask what the status is. And, and frankly, it sounds like the conversations are still going on behind closed doors with the cabinet and the big city mayors. But uh, the public and taxpayers are not going to have the opportunity to have a day. That's why the C Charter Think Tax Coalition was started. We were basically to draw, trying to draw attention to the fact that if you see the word charter, levy, there's lots of ways to call it, but at the end of the day, all it is is a tax. Mm -hmm. And we've been saying that they deserve a referendum, that people deserve a referendum. So if it was a uh, new city tax powers for Calgary, then Calgarians should have a say in a referendum. If it's Edmonton, then Edmontonians should have a say and so forth. Because like Amber said, all this stuff is happening behind closed doors. And that's very problematic because like this is a this would be a historic change in the way that these residents are taxed. If you were to have a gas tax or a sales tax at a municipal level, that's a very fundamental change to the way that cities are able to tax their residents. So we think that, you know, the people who are going to pay those bills should have a say. And it's interesting, too, a report just came out in Toronto, uh, not a report, but sort of news media reports. Um, Toronto had a city charter a few years back and, and got new tax powers. They don't have a sales tax or a gas tax, but they have things like a billboard tax. I think there's a hotel tax. There was a few different um, taxes, one of which um, Rob Ford, actually, when he ran in 2010, campaigned strongly against and got a ton of support for that specific issue because people wanted this tax reversed. Um, I can't remember which one. I think it was the land. I want to see the land transfer tax or the vehicle registration tax. Um, but just now, it's funny because uh, the city is now looking at a whole bunch of new other taxes they can add on. And that's to your point, Jordan, that, you know, you introduce a new, even if it's not one specific avenue of tax. In this case, it's basically a new ability, a new power to be able to levy different taxes other than the property tax. Um, you see that the city is, yeah, initially, maybe it's just a billboard tax and a hotel tax and a car rental tax and all these little things but then you know wait five years or whatever it is and you've got they're setting a whole host of new taxes right the appetite is insatiable they're never really satisfied and uh, and you see that playing out in toronto and yet albertans are still you know potentially going to be denied the right to to be able to to have a say in this and the total tax burden is the number one issue that business owners report is holding their businesses back um, we've asked a few survey questions of our members in terms of would you consider moving if you had the option? I mean, if you're a local flower shop or dry cleaner, it's not easy to pick up and move. But in the city of Calgary, 36% of the businesses we asked said that they would consider picking up and moving because of a tax burden. So I don't hear anybody asking for new taxes. And that's why I think when the mayor says we need to have an honest conversation, he needs to look at the numbers and realize that you know, Calgarians are clamoring for tax relief and whatever kind of mentality of, you know, oh, uh, questioning the motives of some city councils because it's coming up to an election year. Well, you know, that's completely bogus. We need to get this under control and, and stop giving a long list of excuses. You know, we have to examine the scope of government. Does the government need to be funding arenas and all sorts of other ideas, you know? Can we perhaps introduce reform for new employees? So when somebody joins the, the council or if they join uh, the government, maybe they don't get that defined uh, benefit plan or they don't get the ability to bank sick days and all sorts of ridiculous things that would never be offered in the private sector. What we need to do is focus, go back to the basics and focus on, uh, focus on that. Well, the funny thing, Oh, sorry. Sorry, Jordan, you go on. But it's a great point that labor negotiations, one of the best ways to make substantive change is to get the current employees to protect themselves by throwing the future generations under the bus. Um, you know, you saw it in the NHL. You saw it, uh, the city of Penticton here in British Columbia negotiated a like an $8 cut in starting wages in order so that the uh, union there could protect uh, their current workers. So uh, that's a great point that... Um, it's hard to reform the system that's already in place, but the best place to start is, you know, quit hiring people at the higher rates and quit signing, frankly, these executives to open-ended contracts for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, out here, I'm a big proponent for Crown Corps and municipalities. Sign your top employees to two or three-year contracts. So at the end of three years, if it's not working out, you can jettison them without, you know, paying them out half a million bucks. Mm hmm yeah, it just makes sense. It's funny because um, we'll come full circle with our conversation back to Jason Kenney. So back in the 90s, um, 
Alberta and MLAs actually reform their pensions, scrap their gold plated defined benefit pension plans and move to a more sort of what you see more commonplace in other workplaces, an RRSP style retirement savings plans. Um, and, uh, and so that, that was a good policy accomplishment that, that Kenny got done and the Canadian Taxpayers Federation got done here in Alberta. But we have that precedent at the sort of MLA level in this province. And also last year, the MLAs took a 5% pay cut. So actually do have the sort of precedent at a provincial level, despite the fact that we have really bloated spending and very high salaries relative to other provinces. Um, but maybe the councillor should follow in that sort of positive example. It's funny because they're they, they're called on uh, on all of us for ideas for spending cuts because they, they really want to explore this. They really want to see what it's going to take to get to a zero. And then like like two days later or something, they decided to uh, to study a bid for the Olympics and spend five million dollars just studying what a bid would look like. It's uh, it's it's hard to take them seriously sometimes when they say they want to cut spending <clears throat> what are your ideas and then you know they go and do that immediately after absolutely as a first step we're advocating for them to stop and look yeah. at things through the small business lens like given the economic downturn no one's to blame uh, the political level for oil prices but what they are to blame for is continuing to layer on policies that are hindering economic growth and um, that's something that we need to really instill because at the same time, they're looking at all sorts of new uh, proposals, spending proposals. Um, and if they just press pause for a, a minute, um, maybe then we can have the discussion on how to freeze. You know yeah. what we need? We need a take your counselor to work week where we take these <laughs> counselors and we send them out, some to small businesses, some to developers, some like all the different people who have to deal with city hall and all the bureaucracy and stuff. And they have to sit there and deal with the bureaucracy, deal with it. I think you'd find uh, a lot of streamlining, uh, a lot of great ideas on how to make processes quicker uh, would flow out of that. They just don't know. I mean, most of these, I mean, I don't know about most, you know, most of the councils, you know, people who are maybe retired, uh, you know, former principals or teachers, uh, lots of public sector workers go into, uh, go into the politics at that level. You get very few of those business people who go in. And that's why, you know, guys like Rob Ford uh, stand out like unicorns sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, for good reasons and bad. Um, yeah, the, the more kind of business literacy we could get in into uh, city council chambers, I think the better off we'd be. Yeah. Paige, you got a waste of the week for us? I do. <laughs> so we've talked about the waste at the, or the municipal level. At the provincial level, we're seeing obviously just endless waste. It's the exact same thing here in Alberta. Headline after headline after headline of some sort of new spending initiative. It's very to keep up with. The latest one that is uh, it's pretty annoying is that the government spent $5 million um, on advertising for their carbon tax. And uh, it's ridiculous because they could have completely not spent any of that money, not had to, had they just campaigned on a carbon tax. Because that, at that point, they could have educated Albertans about the idea, they could have advertised their plan, whatever. But of course, carbon tax was conveniently left out of the NDP platform. Albertans had no idea it was coming when they voted in the NDP. And so now, uh, now that Albertans hate the carbon tax, they decided to spend $5 million trying to convince everybody to love the carbon tax. So that is uh, pretty wasteful. Paige, Paige, climate change is brand new. How would they have known? It's like come up in the last three months. Come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite frustrating for sure. I know that, um, you know, Wild Rose called for a referendum on the carbon tax because they hadn't campaigned on it. Um, you know, if that had happened, if that had gotten the ball rolling and obviously the government said no to that, but if that had happened, we would have supported it. We weren't calling for a referendum, but you do have to keep in mind that, yeah, like they did not campaign on this. It's a massive multi-billion dollar tax. And, uh, and it, as if they're not spending enough money on the carbon tax as it is, because uh, a good chunk of that revenue is going to go towards basically green corporate welfare to like subsidies to wind energy companies and uh, solar companies and, and the like, which has worked out fabulously in Ontario, helping drive up the cost of electricity prices, which small business owners can look forward to. Um, and yeah, and now they're, 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 just, they're trying to sell it and they're spending a lot of money doing it. And not to mention mm. that leaked memo or report that uh, came out last week and that had to do with uh, citing the carbon tax would cause 15,000 jobs to be lost. It would have a direct impact on GDP. I think GDP would go down between 1 to 1.5% 1 by 2020 or 2022. 
and um, it would have an impact on household income. So we need to see these costs up front before we make the decision because there's a lot of hidden activity. And if they can't do an economic impact assessment to figure out what the impact is going to be, you know, why are we doing it? Another surprise we had was with the CPP. They didn't campaign on it, but uh, Alberta apparently supports that. Never had the conversation. Um, and it's getting ridiculous. Like we see with the minimum wage, even uh, the, the premier's own advisors were saying it was going to result in significant job losses. So until they do that economic impact assessment on each policy, they have to stop. Just yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's funny. The car, so the carbon tax, basically there was this leaked economic impact assessment that showed all of these numbers that Amber uh, just went through. And then the government came out and said, no, 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 that's not accurate because because it's we, we did it a little differently than that. We had studied the policy as if it was going to go a certain way and our climate policy is actually slightly different than that. But a lot of it is still the same. And I think the worst part of that is that the government couldn't then give us updated numbers. They said the numbers from that economic impact assessment were wrong, but they weren't able to provide new numbers. So I'm not sure, you know, if, if it's the most concerning that they went forward with a policy that they knew had a pretty good chance of hurting the economy, given the economic impact assessment that they've done, or that they, excuse me, barreled forward with a policy where they had done no real economic impact assessment. They have no idea they're going in blind. I do not know which of those two things is the most concerning, but it's all bad news. The best way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, remember, is to kill your economy. That is the tried and true tact of how governments reduce uh, carb or, uh, carbon emissions is slow the economy down. And uh, who cares about who gets hurt in the process? Because, hey, uh, what was it Scott says? Uh, all these uh, greenhouse gas reductions in Canada is like taking an eyedropper of water out of a swimming pool. Yeah. Ridiculous. Hey, Amber, yeah. where, can people go, uh, to, where can people go, Amber, to see more of your work? CFIB.ca, we have all our various campaigns up and going on Twitter at A Ruddy. And uh, you can find us on Facebook as well, CFIB. Awesome. Very awesome. good organization. I was talking to a family member of mine yesterday who is a member of CFIB in Nova Scotia and saying that he was really concerned about this CPP hike and that CFIB is his, <laughs> his only light in the darkness that <laughs> he sees uh, some perhaps positive progress being made. So it's a great organization. Absolutely. Well, that's it for this episode of Tax Talk from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Be sure to follow Paige on Twitter at Paige McP. You can follow me at Jordan Bateman and you can follow Amber at A Ruddy. Uh, if you're watching this on Blab, be sure to subscribe to our feed. Give us props because we're very needy and we are the 20th ranked uh, podcast in the uh, government and organization side of iTunes, which tells you how thin it is on, I on the iTunes these days. <laughs> You can check out our website at taxpayer.com. Summer's a bit crazy, so we'll have a sporadic recording schedule, i.e. whenever Paige and I happen to be working at the same time and uh, wanting to chat on a Friday morning. Um, but we'll keep you in the loop uh, on Facebook and on uh, Twitter about upcoming broadcasts. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.